Okay. Um, before I start, I want to apologize for running over time. I think the lunch break started about two minutes ago, but uh, um, I'll be quick. Um, so I want to uh, basically um, introduce um, a way of storing images, image data and metadata that uh, um, will be coming with uh, the uh, new um, generation of detectors, of X-ray detectors that uh, has started uh, shipping this year. And uh, the first three point, the first two points, if I use this thing. Uh, first two points, uh, the need for a new format and uh, the format itself, this uh, I want to take uh, quite briefly. And uh, the metadata considerations is what is really important uh, to me and uh, where hopefully there will be some discussion as well. Um, so some of you in the macromolecular crystallography community might be familiar with the uh, Pilatus detectors and uh, with how uh, images uh, are saved or used to be saved in the past. So we have one, or how data sets were saved. We have one uh, frame, one, one image, one file per image, one image per file. And uh, the metadata is in uh, plain text uh, in, the, in the header, basically. So there's a binary image, and uh, the header contains the metadata. And that was OK with the slow detectors, but it's reaching its limits. Um, uh, these, uh, the new Eiger detectors, they can collect, uh, well, several thousand images in a matter of uh, seconds. and. Uh, File creation, uh, file opening, and all that uh, puts quite a load on the on the file system. And also, the, the size of these uh, uh, 60 or 70 million pixel detectors uh, per image gets very large. And uh, so, we were thinking of how we can facilitate uh, data acquisition, but at the same time, also uh, storage, archiving, and, and all these things. So, like I said, several thousands of uh, uh, frames in an extremely short period of time. So what we want to do is uh, use as a container format. So we can put everything into a big container and uh, you don't have to deal with all these files. Um, we want to have, oops, we want to have uh, fast uh, compression, but also, uh, well, good compression, but also fast and, and especially transparent that the user isn't, uh, uh, doesn't really notice it's there. Um, and then uh, header information that comes from the detector, and also uh, header information, or maybe experiment information that comes from the beam line or from the diffractometer, or more generally from the, from the user, like information re relating to the uh, experiment. Of course, the parameters were mentioned before. Uh, so for none of this that we invent anything new, really, we just made use of uh, existing tools. Uh, the file format that we chose was, uh, is HDF5, which uh, stands for Hierarchical Data Format, and that's really something that's uh, in, in use, established in, uh, in, in fields that use big data. So uh, astrophysics, uh, particle collision physics, meteor meteorology, banks, uh, they, they use this format. Um, it, uh, it is a container format like the good old tar, but it's much more powerful um, because it uh, can store uh, metadata. Um, and it's, it's, you can put anything in that you want, really. It's, it's very, very flexible and has uh, easy, uh, straightforward APIs to interact with that. So you don't have to, well, you have to learn some new things, but uh, it's fairly simple. And there's a lot of tools for uh, visualization for manipulation for for analysis and all that. Um, so this was mentioned already. Uh, I think Bob Ladek, data is, uh, is just stuff that, uh, that lies around that fills space and when you get a new hard disk it's generally forgotten. What we are interested in is, uh, or at the first level is information that's I guess useful data, data put in context and uh, uh, maybe some structure with it, and then from that we can generate knowledge and wisdom. Uh, so 
the, the metadata is really what uh, provides the context and the structure to the data to make it useful. Okay. Uh, in the meta, for the metadata, we uh, use the Nexus format. And Nexus is basically a common data format for neutron, X-ray, and muon science. That's why this uh, unwieldy acronym stands for neutron, X-ray, and muons. Uh, it uses HDF5 as the container to, to put the data in. And uh, it's basically a hierarchical uh, representation of the, the metadata. And uh, this is schematically shown here. You have this. It's almost like a, a file system inside, inside the container. And like this file tree. That will become clearer later. So now besides these, uh, uh, here you... I should say you do have uh, you have data uh, nexus groups, and inside these groups there are um, data definitions. For me, a bit confusing. All these what's inside these these groups are called data sets, but this is really the, the metadata. Uh, nexus also has a number of uh, application definitions. So this is a subset of these groups and uh, and fields written for a particular application. So this exists for lower, for scattering, small angle scattering, but also for macromolecular crystallography. This is this NXMX. And uh, Herbert uh, Bernstein, who might be watching, uh, did a lot of work to, to set this up. Um, so in, uh, so that's basically the, the background. So in, in practice, what does it look like? Uh, when you collect data in this new way, you always get at least two files. So one is the master file, and that's where all the metadata is, and then there are the data files themselves. And in the, uh, in the master file, there are links to these uh, uh, data files. And the data files are not necessarily individual images, but uh, can be sets of images, 10 images, 100 images, 1,000 images. To the user, again, this is uh, transparent. You always work with the master file. So for example, with your image viewer, you would open this master file and then go to image uh, 5,900. And then the image viewer, because of the link that is written in the master file, knows where this image 5,700 is. So on a hard disk, uh, it looks like this. Uh, these are two. Um, Two data sets. First, there's a, there's a small data set here from a, from a 4M detector. Uh, you see the master file and the uh, one data file. This one data file contains, uh, in this case, 720 images. But on the hard disk, you don't have this uh, whole load of images. It's just two files. Now, you also here see uh, a data set collected within uh, 16Ms, or our largest here you have uh, 52 uh, gigabytes of data. Uh, I should say that these are um, compressed, so the raw data I think is 260 or so gigabytes. Uh, this compresses to 52 um, in, in this case, in four data files. So these were 3,600 images. Uh, Bunched in, in sets of 1,000 images, 15 gigabyte files, and the last one is obviously a bit smaller. Now, this was not the smartest way of doing it, obviously, because uh, because of uh, um, compatibility with antiquity, you probably want to go below four gigabytes per uh, per file because 32-bit uh, file systems cannot handle this. Uh, but this this can be set during data collection. In this case, this was probably mishandled a little bit. Uh, you might wonder, since we're talking about metadata, uh, the master file contains 349 megabytes. So like 349 megabytes of, uh, of metadata, that's a lot. Um, this is explained in part by uh, there being 16 or 17 million pixels here, and you have a, a flat field and a pixel mask, and uh, these things these things add up. So these uh, these um, metadata get quite substantial. Now the types of metadata that uh, uh, are 
let's say, collected during the experiment are, you'll find out, rather limited because they're supposed to be quite general. So at the first hand, you have some detector parameters. Obviously, there are invariable detector parameters, the name, the, the type of the detector, what the sensor is, the thickness, what is the pixel size. Uh, all these things that never change. And then there are some built-in uh, parameters that the user can actually change, the flat field, the, the pixel mask. You might, at some point, upload the new versions of that. But these are inherent in the detector. Then, oh yes. So then, uh, are there are experimental parameters. And here we want to distinguish between two kinds of parameters. Essential uh, experimental parameters. Um, this is the, the photon energy, uh, which you, or the, th the uh, threshold which you have to set, otherwise the detector cannot uh, collect data. Also the frame time, uh, the detector has to know um, how long to expose. But there's also important metadata that are, the detector really doesn't care about, the detector doesn't, doesn't care where it sits, and uh, the detector also doesn't care how fast the craniometer spins, it just uh, collects the data. But we decided to include these parameters anyway. Um, and I should say that all these parameters, well, at least the experimental parameters here, they can be set through the API when you interact with the detect, when you set up your experiment. You can, you can define these parameters. And then you can hit go and not before that. Uh, we decided to include these optional parameters just because they're, they're only optional for data collection, but they're quite critical for um, data processing. And uh, yeah, and with these, uh, we're, we're able now to um, process data from the, from the detector and also basically to auto proc the uh, global phasing uh, pipeline can auto process the data. Now, I'll get to the limitations of this in a minute. Um, I should also mention that the experimental values here are set through the API. So when you uh, set up data collection, you give these values. So these are actually not really experimental values because they're not measured. But you could set up your beam line to replace the, uh, the oscillation angles with the actual oscillation angle, which might not be 90 or might not be 10 degrees at a given point, but 10.005, and maybe that's important to you. You could, uh, you could put these data, of course, into the metadata. So uh, you can grab this uh, program HDF view. This is all uh, freely available um, stuff that you can download from the web. HDF view, you open your master file, and uh, so what you see here is this uh, tree structure. Um, like I said, HDF, hierarchical data format, so you have a hierarchy. The hierarchy starts at this uh, entry point. This is basically the root of uh, what's inside uh, an HDF5 file. And, and then uh, below that uh, are entries. Uh, the first point here is data. So here you have uh, these uh, four links that I mentioned before to, uh, to the image. Uh, to the data files. And down here, there's associated information, so that tells you that in this data 0001, uh, you have 1,000 images of uh, 4,300 by 4,100 pixels. So the images are, the data are saved as arrays of uh, pixel values. Um, so then you got the, uh, the instrument, uh, in the instrument, um, some, I just want to highlight some points what you can expect here. You can uh, download the uh, data set if you want to from our website and, and explore this yourself and see if this makes sense. But for example, the, the wavelength is saved here. It's uh, in, in Ongstrom, the unit in this older version that I'm showing here because I, I didn't update this image. Here it's still showing the unit as en pair, which is not correct. In the current version, this is actually given as uh, Ongstrom. Uh, but this is uh, this is all defined by by the Nexus committee. How do you uh, what units do you give? How do you uh, put where do you put the the wavelength? What should the the wavelength field be called? So the wavelength field is always called incident wavelength. You cannot just in your header or if 
you set up uh, metadata, you cannot call it wavelength, so it's always incident wavelength. And this way, the software in the end knows where things are and how to find things and uh, can deal with this. So just another example here, the, the beam standard. So all these, these things are in here. Now, this is, uh, I guess, uh, for, for talk, this is nice. This gives you a graphical view of what's going on. But in reality, you are unlikely to inspect your files this way with the GUI. But there's tools that you can automate this or you can script this. So first of all, there's the command line utilities of the HDF5 library itself. So you can do an H5LS minus D to get the data. And then you have your master file. And you have the whole tree, entry, instrument, detect, the beam, X, Y. Uh, so entry instrument detector beam XY and this command would give you this number or you can use a Python API called H5 Pi that uh, allows you to, to read from uh, these uh, master files or to even write add uh, data to it. So under the detector uh, field here there is overall maybe a few dozen uh, parameters that are saved. Okay, nevertheless, this is an important point, the metadata are incomplete. I mentioned already at the beginning that we tried to give a minimal complement that would be useful, but at the same time, the first law of archiving says some unrecorded detail will always become critical later. And trying to get complete metadata is fighting entropy. So this, this doesn't work. Um, what we decided is to give something that's minimal but still sufficient. But um, since this is an open and free format, anyone can extend metadata and, uh, and, and add what they consider important. So uh, I think uh, Herbert will uh, later talk about uh, the question of beamline geometry that was mentioned a few times before. What are your axes? Which way are they oriented? Which way is your beam? We're not concerned with this at all from the detector point of view because we can't. But we definitely encourage uh, detect, uh, diffractometer manufacturers and uh, the uh, beamlines to, to add these uh, metadata that describe the geometry in a way that uh, basically this universal beamline uh, geometry that, that Herbert will mention. And, uh, and if you do add anything, if, uh, there are some people from Synchrotrons here, if you add something, keep to the standards, commun communicate and share. And uh, the guys from the, uh, the Nexus uh, committee, they should be the, uh, really the authority on how things are done. So suggest to them and, and talk and, and have something that is basically universal. That in the end, to me, it would be a good way if I got a data set and I don't have to care if it comes from the photon factory or from ESRF or I can just uh, process it because the, the geometry is, is defined correctly. So now there's another point, uh, maybe going to this fraud potentially, do not modify existing metadata because that kind of, uh, um, to me, this almost defeats the purpose of writing this in in the first place because uh, metadata is associated with the experiment. If you later go and change things instead of adding something in a different place, then uh, you're making a big mess. Uh, and that leads to some unresolved questions, maybe also relating to the talk that we just heard. Uh, how do you protect your data? How do you protect your metadata? Um, I mentioned that there are links in, uh, in the master files that lead to the data files. How do you know that the data files that sit in the same directory are still the data files that were there when the data were collected? You could swap them out and the links, if the file names are the same, the links would still be valid. So how can you do that? These are all questions. I don't have any answers for this. Uh, how can you verify the identity of the uh, associated uh, data files? or the integrity of the data files. Um, is there a way that uh, maybe at the beamline or in the diffractometer you could protect subsets of metadata so that the user in the end cannot 
uh, modify them, update them, that the user has access to the metadata, obviously, to read, and to the metadata tree to add, populate other branches, but not uh, modify existing metadata. Is there a way for that? I don't know. Um, I'm definitely interested in hearing opinions and suggestions and all that. So is there a mechanism inside HDF5 to do any of this? I don't think so, but then I'm not a computer scientist and I don't know enough to really answer this question. Uh, can uh, the Nexus committee in some way agree on something or find a solution? Maybe, I don't know. Uh, and that brings me to the end of the talk. I'm hungry, so I went a bit faster. Uh, what I just want to re-emphasize is that uh, IGER data will come with metadata. It will contain the metadata to describe the, uh, the detector, and uh, there will be some experimental metadata. And together, these data are sufficient for processing. However, uh, to make it truly automated, like independent of the beamline, this will require some additional metadata, especially on the geometry. But there are ways of uh, including that, and uh, we encourage that this actually be included uh, during the experiment. And then more on that, uh, on the uh, female metadata after lunch. And uh, thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, some real data crunch uh, things there you uh, table for us. So questions? So it's Mike Probert from Newcastle. Um, you, you raise an excellent point, um, and it actually relates to everything that's being said, um, that even as a, a manufacturer yourself, you're reliant for certain metadata on the goniometer manufacturers. And it raises the point that it doesn't matter what metadata we want, if it's to be linked truly with the raw data, we need buy-in from the instrument manufacturers themselves who are not here. Um, so. I, I guess it's a question really for, for John and Brian. Is there an open dialogue with them at the moment or not? Well, I guess we're, I'm here, so there's some dialogue. Um, and I guess it's dear to our heart anyway because the data come from the detector and people approach us always when there's something missing and can you include this and can you include this? And frequently we have to say that, uh, well, we don't know. We don't know about the beam line, which the detector sits there. It, the detector doesn't know this. But certainly, um, we want to encourage ways of including information from the... Uh, for macromolecular crystallography, maybe it's less the manufacturers and more the synchrotrons because most, most data are collected there. But of course, uh, Brigaku, Baruch, or whoever, um, they also have uh, a stake in that. Brian, do you want to comment on the efforts to engage all the manufacturers? Well, I just make the comment that in putting together this workshop, uh, I did approach a number of um, uh, potential sponsors, um, most of whom were very interested and very active in their response, several of whom said, uh, we're out of uh, petty cash at the moment. Um, but that engagement, I think, was very useful because what we want is, is not just cash, but the actual uh, collaboration and making, you know, making the importance of these issues known to them. So that's, that's, I think, a function that this, this whole working group activity can lead to. Simon Cole, Southampton. I've worked with Rigaku, and uh, uh, this is uh, a matter of concern from them. But what really concerns them is that before they knit this into a product is that there's not a moving target. We need to establish a set of rules and definitions and stick to it. And then they will develop their software and systems to support it. But whilst it's a moving target, uh, you know, they'll, they'll end up having to support multiple different uh, kind of formats or systems. So it's down to us to set a definition and then, uh, then it can be adopted. I mean, some beamlines which have your Eiger detector, they convert HD5 into CDF. And you, you, you see that I think that in all the discussion, 
we have to make distinction between what is possible and what is beneficial. And I'm not sure, at least in protein crystallography, whether having a very fast detector, one or two orders of magnitude faster than Pilatus 6M, is really beneficial. Because Pilatus 6M is so fast that people, as I shown you before, are doing crazy things just because we can do that faster. Yes? But because we can do something, it does not mean that we uh, have to do that. And, what, and that this is beneficial. In US, if you have a car which has maximum speed uh, 250 miles per hour, it's useless. Yes, and for that reason, all the, these cars, when they are important to US, their speed is limited electronically to 128 miles per hour. Yes, you cannot drive faster. And try to drive from Charlottesville to Washington in Madison County more than uh, 70 miles per hour. You are immediately arrested. Yes, the, the police has, it, it, it's not enough that you are getting a, a penalty, yes? You are arrested. You have to be in jail if you are speeding more than 15 miles per hour. And maybe we should do something like that. <laughs> Come on, Vladek. <laughs> Does that mean it's lunchtime? This, this kind of detector makes things possible that you would never think of. No, and yes. there's no speed limit. No, I agree that this detector makes possible many, many things. But I'm not sure if we, if we would like to have super sophisticated format. Well, yes, for, mean, for all applications, for all applications, for some applications, yes but not necessary for all applications. I see even with the um, protein crystallography with the uh, new beam lines or new synchrotrons that are coming along, you have such high intensity that you just, uh, you can do two, one of two things. You either attenuate the beam or you make your detector faster because otherwise you kill your crystal too fast. And now you can argue whether you need these super um, intense synchrotrons, but the fact is you have them and uh, I think a fast detector, you need a fast detector with a highly brilliant synchrotron. Correct, yes. And you do have that these days. I mean, you can spin in 360 degrees per second. Last question, before long. Uh, Mike Wall from Los Alamos. Uh, so uh, addressing this last point, more of a comment, I guess, maybe if it were possible to retrieve these images from the database in a way such that you can select an effective oscillation range and get a data set out that sums up the images over some range that would address this concern of how people might be using the data. Um, another comment, I guess, is that um, I often run into the headache of encountering headers that have incorrect information in it coming off the beam line. Maybe the distance is incorrect, the beam center. Um, so I wonder if there's room um, in this discussion also for including two different types of uh, header information, one that corresponds to what the beamline tells you that each of these things are, and another one that corresponds to some model that you develop, say, based on the indexing uh, of the distance and, and so on. So that's something that would be useful to me. Definitely, and that's something that I didn't mention because I was rushing through this so much, but... Uh, um, Certainly, there is no, uh, no standards for this, to my knowledge, at this point. But uh, you could also imagine that the, the user wants to put uh, additional stuff after the fact into the, uh, into the header file, basically either maybe an updated beam center, things like this. But also, you could associate process data. You put your crystal parameters, things like that. That's all not, uh, I mean, that's all possible at this point. But at this point, anything is possible. And what we want really is that not anything is possible, but specific things are possible and everything that is useful. Um, 
And that's, I guess, that's why we have this discussion, really, what do we define as, uh, as useful? It's a splendid point, and I think the role of, say, the IUCR commissions to um, define this in an agreed, community-driven way is really vital. We have a chairman of a commission here, Tom Terwilliger, so um, I'm sure he's taking uh, hearty note of these valid points. I hope he thinks they're valid. We'll break for lunch, and we must meet here strictly at 2 o'clock because we've got our two... Uh,